Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. On Sunday, the president of the United States tweeted, quote, why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? Then come back and show us how it's done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough, unquote. The president was talking about four freshman congresswomen of color, all Americans, known as the squad. Up next on Another View, why race-baiting language is not new to politics and why words absolutely matter. Stay tuned. Another View with Dr. Eric Claville and the Claville Report is coming up next. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. That was the chant of the audience at a Trump rally in Greenville, North Carolina on Wednesday. It happened when, pres- when the president was speaking of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who is a United States citizen and Muslim. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. President Trump has engaged in a full-blown attack this week on four freshman congresswomen of color known as the squad. Michigan Representative Rashida Tlaib, Massachusetts Representative Ayanna Presley. New York Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar. Today on Another View, we're not going to debate whether you think President Trump is racist. Instead, we're going to talk about race baiting language and how it is used politically to divide and conquer. Joining me to talk about this history is this is history, political and law expert, Dr. Eric Claville with his award winning Claville Report. How you doing, Eric? Doing great, Barbara. (laughs) Good. It's been a while. So I watched on Wednesday night. I happened to be going past the den and and MSNBC was on and they were showing the uh, rally. And I heard that rallying cry send her back. And, you know, it wasn't fear, but it definitely made me uneasy. And it caused me to seriously pause and go, I I really can't believe this 2019. We keep saying that it's 2019, yet this continues to happen. Um, What what were your initial thoughts when you first heard that this was happening? (laughs) Well, uh, Barbara, I I also was struck with uh, trepidation as well, but also not surprised. And when I say that, it's because there's been a misinformation campaign uh, for white America as a whole from the very beginning as it relates to the Native peoples that have been here, the Native Americans, the Africans that were imported here as slaves, and then all of the immigrants that came that were not able to assimilate into white America, which is a very uh, <clears throat> important distinction um, th- that we'll make on this show uh, mm-hmm. moving forward. But if you if you look at Trump's campaign from the very beginning, and I'll even start it during President Obama's administration, the birther movement, you know, President Trump was one that took that mantle and wrote it into mm-hmm. the his presidency, Obama not being born in America. Uh, now, <clears throat> when in, in stating that he wasn't born here, he said, well, he may not have been. He su- submitted a, a, a certificate, but, you know, birth certificate is better. It's hard to get. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's not. So, again, you're you're misleading through various rhetorical devices, individuals sending what we call dog whistles and code language of, of racial of race baiting uh, to individuals who already have a hatred and a miseducation mm-hmm. of people of color in this country. Case in point. Point. Um, keep in mind, in order for <clears throat> the colonial powers to have taken the land uh, from Native Americans, mm-hmm. you kind of had to label them in, in, in a way that it would it would be OK to kill them. So a lot of Na- Native Americans were labeled as savages. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Again, you have Nav- Native peoples that <laughs> lived in this country. Uh, this but yet they for- were the ones considered to be savage, even right. though they were here first. Right. And, 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 <laughs> and a lot of Native Na- mm-hmm. uh, uh, tribes. In, in the Americas were lauded for and known for their reverence of the environment, reverence for uh, of the life 
uh, the wildlife that's here and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. But you saw great numbers of extinctions of not only Native Americans, but also uh, destroying of the lands and also destroying of of, uh of the native animals here mm -hmm. by the Europeans and the white colonials that took the land from them. Eric, let's, let's give, give a definition of race baiting language so that people are very clear mm -hmm. on what we're talking about here, because, because this goes well beyond the individual, meaning Mr. Trump or whomever happens to be speaking um, about this, but because it's coming from the leader of this country yes. and it takes on a different weight Yes. Than you and I may perhaps, you know, even the two of us talking about it. So what is race baiting language? And and um, and then we can talk about it throughout history, some right. of the ways that it, it's manifested itself. So I'll say race baiting and I'll use code language as okay. well. So it'd mm -hmm. be pretty much interchangeable. But when we talk about race baiting and code language, it's, it's language that is assigned or spoken to a group of people against another group in order to bring up or, or the original group. Right. The, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> so the person doing the race baiting, basically uh -huh. assigning language to another group to disparage that group. Right. To disparage, That's the right, to say it. Right, to, to disparage that group. Mm -hmm. Now it, I'll, I'll, I'll pull something from the late Lee Atwater, who was the, you know, uh, strategist of the Southern strategy where, you know, he stated in, in an interview where, there are certain words that you can't say. For example, prior to 1965, you couldn't say, well, you could say the N-word and it wouldn't hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, after 1965, you couldn't say the N-word because it would hurt you politically and also in business to a certain extent. Uh, so you would end up saying things like welfare mother, welfare queen, or you end up saying things such as law and order. Or you end up saying, which was used by Reagan, and these are all words that he helped to to foster. You use the words such as super predator, or thug, or use things such as, you know, force busing, or we're going to uh, cut, you know, free. There's no free lunch in America, you know, things of that nature, where you're not assigning in an actual derogatory name to a certain group of people. But what you're doing is that you're assigning uh, a code talk or dog whistle that now starts to uh, disparage them and bring up those the, those feelings and those the, the, that miseducation that individuals received about that particular group. So the, and the, the whole idea of, of this also is the, back to that feeling of, of, because it incites a feeling inside yes. of people that could turn violent um, yes. at, at worst, um, you know, causes people, causes massive distrust um, and, and just is a huge disruptor. And the purpose being to get people on your side ultimately to vote. Is that ultimate? Is that well, the ultimate purpose? What well, is the ultimate purpose well, of this? <laughs> well, in, 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 well in, in, in politics, Barbara, it is to get the vote, but it's also to consolidate and keep power. This is all about power, okay? Whether it be through political power, whether it be through uh, business or commercial power, uh, whether it be through the power of the people, okay? Keep in mind that even that if you can get a certain people to believe a certain lie, then they'll, they'll give their lives for it, you know, all, all, all the time. Uh, case in point, now we're not. We're going to start uh, a little earlier in history, okay. recent time. Then, then we'll go back. Okay. Um, the the white male that killed uh, the parishioners in the AME Church in South Carolina. Uh, he actually stated that the reason why he was doing it is because you know blacks were taking uh, were raping the white women or taking the white women. Blacks were taking the country away from the, the white man and so forth. Now, you hear all of these things that were spoken, you know, all the way back to uh, pre, well, during the Civil War and then also post-Civil War during the Reconstruction era, which is why Reconstruction in part uh, mm -hmm. failed, not because it wasn't good, but because you had this this miseducation and this this. Uh, this this disparaging of a group of people saying that they can't do certain they do. things. They're not smart enough. They're not smart enough. enough. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And also they're going to take something, this country away from us, the poor, 
uh, the pure Aryan white man Christian mm-hmm. and, 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 and so forth. So the birth of a nation, the original movie, not the one made by Nate Park, but the original movie itself was mm-hmm. a resurgence of, you know, the white man standing up. Uh, and we, we say in the South, but we know also the North and the Midwest and the West also had their uh, racial issues as well that don't get publicized a lot in history. But it was the resurgence of the white man now reclaiming his dominance, you know, over the land and so forth. Now, uh, let's take a look at Charlottesville, which happened just a few years, a couple of years ago uh, here in the state of Virginia. So we have South Carolina where parishioners that accepted a white uh, visitor into the church. He sat through Bible study at before they dismissed, gave the dismissal. He pulled out a gun and killed all of them in the church. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at Charlottesville. In Charlottesville, they were saying death to all blacks and Jews. Jews will not replace us. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we talk about groups that were able to assimilate as white. Okay. So European Jews were able to assimilate as white because of skin color. And some Mm -hmm. of them actually changed their names in order to seem more white. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because of the oppression that they received in Germany and other Eastern European states. Uh, So they knew, you know, (laughs) what what, what could happen to them. Mm -hmm. But you have other people who are immigrants, other nations that are not able to assimilate as white because they're black. They come from black nations uh, and they can't change their skin color, for example. And you have policies that are enacted against them. Case in point, in Florida, you have the Haitians, you have the white Cubans, Mm -hmm. you have wet foot, dry foot, you you know, for the Cubans. If you come here and you make it a dry land, you can stay. No questions asked. If you're Haitian, you come here, you're going to get deported back. Okay. That was a big to do Mm -hmm. Uh, years ago in in the Congress. That policy still exists to to this day to where they're discriminated against, all based upon (laughs) where they come from and, you know, what many would see as their skin color. Um, Let's take a look. Uh, at not only what happened in Charlottesville, but let's look at what happened in Louisiana. In Louisiana, just Mm -hmm. three months ago, you had a white male uh, who was the son of a sheriff deputy there that burned three black churches down, historical black churches. And I know those areas because I pass through it all the time. That's right, because you're from there. You know, so again, it's this belief that whites whites are going to be outnumbered. It's this belief that people of color are going to take what the white man has and it's going to take their country and they're going to be outnumbered. It's this fear and it's this fear mongering that started all the way during the time of slavery. You know, we're, you know, the fear of the black male or as Reagan would put it, these black bucks, you know, which he received retribution against. So he stopped using buck. But um as he's fear of these black men taking the white women and so forth. Uh, you have to keep these individuals under subjection. So you have different laws that, that basically are very brutal that help to keep them, quote unquote, in line. In line. You have these slave codes that help to keep them in line. After, the, after slavery, uh, you have these same laws that become black codes, which again are, are very harsh laws, <clears throat> which says that these individuals have to prove that they're citizens, right? And they can't be in a certain place at a certain time. And then in every jurisdiction, you have these what are called local, local laws. You knew that there were certain places you couldn't go where we call it over the railroad tracks. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only that certain- you just were not <laughs> welcome because you knew from, from living there that, exactly. that what would happen to you. You were told that, yeah. uh, you know, and it wasn't written in law. But it was passed down, and you knew, and there were blacks that did uh, uh, go against those local rules, and mm-hmm. that they were they received very harsh punishment. A lot of them received death. So if you talk to a lot of African Americans and a lot of whites during that time, but they say, well, yes, that did exist in that particular area, uh, our area during that time. And again, that was based upon jurisdiction where you mm-hmm. live, local laws. Uh, now, <clears throat> let's take a look at what happened with disparaging African Americans, and we'll talk about the uh, unfortunately the Hispanic uh, community now that that uh, Trump is disparaging. But we talk about the uh, Jim Crow laws, you know, Jim, and of course, Jim Crow himself. And of course we did a show on blackface. Yes, we did, on blackface and all. Because of what took place here mm-hmm. in uh, the state of Virginia, revealing, you know, the history of blackface mm-hmm. uh, at our universities, with our elected officials, and also with, within our white communities. And also basically uncovering that era during the time of segregation at hundred years after the civil war between which reconstruction existed right between those two. So now you have a disparaging of African, 
African-Americans as being, even though legislatures uh, during the time in the states and also in Congress were passing laws intentionally to benefit whites and blacks, okay, during mm-hmm. that time period, mm-hmm. they, they were <clears throat> characterized through cartoons. Uh, they were characterized through political uh, cartoons and writings as being these uh, big lip, very black, uh, big belly, shysters, uh, people you couldn't trust and things of that nature, when it was actually the, the exact opposite. Um, doing, and then that particular image followed African-Americans all the way through, uh, through Jim, the Jim Crow era. You get the mammy uh, as it relates to the black black female. You get the uh, buckwheat uh, from the little rascals imagery of the mm-hmm. children not well kept and things of that nature. So now you get these disparaging images coupled with the wor- the, the words the, the language. words exactly. So then you get a visual, you get the actual language, and then you take one incident that took place and you disparage an entire group with it. Okay, which is what a stereotype is, mm-hmm. taking one one incident or one example and then painting, painting the, entire, the entire, entire group, group with it. i uh, give you a good point. Uh, case in point, let's look at Willie Horton, right? Oh, yes. Willie Horton, <laughs> which was the, uh, which Lee Atwater did apologize for uh, after he got cancer. He was on his deathbed. He apologized for that, uh, those statements. And again, for just as a side note, if you got to apologize for it before you die, then obviously there's something Something pulling at you that said you should have done it in the first place. But um, <laughs> so Lee Atwater used Willie Harden. And then, of course, you're talking about law and order. You're talking about these individuals uh, that were in prison. If you let them out, this is what they're going to do. They're going to be just like Willie Harden. And that attached to Dukakis, that attached to individuals who wanted to be fair in the criminal justice system as being mm-hmm. soft and the opposite of being very, very hard, which is now we start to get these during the Reagan administration. He carried that on through, uh, which now we start to get these very harsh incarceration laws uh, to which we attach to uh, drug use and things of that nature for a certain group of people. But they, but they mainly affect a certain group, that same group of people that you've been disparaging exactly. all along. Oh, exactly. Uh, Even though the laws are passed for everyone. Yeah. And that's the difference between, I think that people don't, under, when they don't understand what it means when we talk about institutional racism, meaning right. these laws that are set up and they are deliberately set up to make sure that certain groups of people only get so far. Exactly. Exactly. And it really takes a generation for that those, those that miseducation to die out, right? So you have a group of people who said, oh, you know, don't go over this side of railroad tracks. You can't play with those kids. That group of people still believes that, you know, and what, but it was a happening. Their grandchildren end up playing with those kids. So yeah. they have no idea what their grandparents are talking about, or even their parents, but it takes that generation to die out for that miseducation to actually uh, leave, uh, to, well, to die with it. Um, now, when you start to look at the Hispanics, uh, there's always been disparaging uh, stereotypes about them, uh, disparaging things about when they cross over the water and so forth, you know, disparaging names and 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 so forth. Uh, and however, well, even when, when President Obama, uh, President Obama, when President Trump was running for office and the first thing he says, when the Mexicans come over, they're drug lords. They, yeah. you know, they don't send their best. I mean, all those code words, again, yeah. disparaging this group of people. As a matter of fact, the, the current acting DHS uh, head and keep in mind, a lot of these individuals are still acting. And Mm -hmm. that also speaks to the instability of our government. Some very, very important positions, and there's just no stability there. Um, Mainly in Homeland Security, which is the most interesting thing. I mean, because that's the thing that that was put into place so that once we were attacked by 9-11 and so forth, to make sure that that never happens again. But yet every lead person in that division isn't acting. Exactly. Uh, But even, you know, they... He did an interview, and of course, uh, they played back one thing that he stated when he said he's been to the border and he's looked in the face of of these men, and they are, you know, they're 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 MS thirteen. I I can see it in their eyes, you know. And he said, "We're not going to let these people go." Senator Lindsey Graham, you know, said they can stay four hundred days. We're not going to let these individuals go. But is that type of talk and that type of fear mongering 
that allows individuals to um, uh, react in a way that is inhumane, that react in a way that is just not right. Um, let's take a look at what happened at the Trump uh Trump uh, rally even before he became president. Remember the black uh, individual that was there protesting? Mm -hmm. I think it was Arizona. And they were escorting him out and someone from the audience just Mm -hmm. hauled Hauled off and and punched him. him. Mm -hmm. You know, now this is an individual. He doesn't know that man. They don't know each other. They're just taking him out. But because of what's being spewed in that audience, I mean, he felt a need in himself to punch this this man in his face. Mm-hmm. Uh, the individual that killed uh, the young lady in Charlottesville, you know, he was just there with a car revving it up and then decided to run into that group of people and end up killing one person, injuring quite a few. You have individuals who call themselves protectors of the homeland who outfit themselves in battle gear, automatic weapons that came up in our state in Charlottesville, you know, and nothing happened to them, by the way. I just want to throw it out there. And they were eight, they were allowed to come up there uh, to, to, know, to, to, to do that. You I, have individuals at the border yes. now, 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 Barbara, protects of the homeland who are, quote unquote, helping out the Border Patrol. I mean, these are private citizens that are taking it up on themselves who could end up, who knows what they're doing. We'd have no idea mm-hmm. what they've done to people. We have no idea if, you know, we just don't know. In the New York Times, the article, Trump disavows center back chant as GOP frets over ugly phrase. Um, they talk about the fact that um, the House is working to develop higher level security protocols for Ms. Omar and the three colleagues, yeah. the women of, of the squad, especially given an onslaught of threatening material on social media where white nationalists have praised the president's statements and the hashtag send her back was trending Thursday Hello. on Twitter. I mean, it's, that's frightening. It is. It is. And, you know, it doesn't get reported a lot uh, because this administration didn't want to, uh, he wanted to unify the nation. Uh, this is President Obama. But during his administration, there was me- and, and, and a peak increase of white right. national, nationalist groups or hate groups and so forth, uh, not just against uh, uh, uh Blacks, but also against Jews and other uh, individuals of color. And keep in mind that, you know, when we talk about race, race in, in America and really race in the world, black and white are the in caps. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have every everybody else That's in the middle. In, 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 right. <laughs> in between. So now we talk about gender as well. I was speaking to a colleague about this and and, you know, we were talking about some other things, but I said one thing that a group of, in, and one thing that's more, and this is just from my experience, mm-hmm. uh, radio audience, this is my, my experience. One thing I found that is uh, harder for individuals to accept uh, is, it's harder for individuals to accept a woman, especially a woman of color and power to tell them what to do as it is for a man, a black, mm-hmm. or a black man in, in, in power. I said, it's, I, in part, that gender plays a part in what we're seeing as well. Um, and also gender coupled with, with, with color, with these women being of color. All these women are either, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, when we take a look at individuals who have been marginalized. They represent all those individuals. You have Presley, who's African-American mm-hmm. out of Massachusetts. You have a uh, Omar, who is an immigrant Sudanese. Uh, no, is she? She she's from um, not not Ethiopia, but I. I yes, yes. Is she? Yeah, Ethiopia? I believe I believe so. <laughs> um, you have her. You have Cortez, who's also Cortez Hispanic, who's Hispanic. Uh, d- mm-hmm. descent, and then you have the other um, uh, politician, who's also from Tlaib. Right, Tlaib, mm-hmm. who's also mm-hmm. um, Middle Eastern. Mid- Middle Eastern. So mm-hmm. you, you have all these groups now that are have been targeted in the last, let's just say, fifty years, right? So mm-hmm. African Americans, you know, we all know. I mean, we don't need a history lesson on that. If you look at people, uh, individuals who are from Middle Eastern descent. Mm-hmm. You know, especially what Omar said. I agree. After nine eleven, every every person with a with mm-hmm. a with a with a head wrap or with a turban is looked upon as being a terrorist. You know, she even um, talks about the fact that she's more concerned about the whole idea of 
of more Muslims being attacked yeah. than she is about her own safety because she recognizes that that this was a well as a matter of fact I'll read her exact quote she says what I'm scared for is the safety of people who share my identity says Ms. Omar who has stood out in Congress with colorful head coverings yeah. when you have a president who clearly thinks someone like me should go back the message that he is sending is not for me it is for every single person who shares my identity now look she, she's exactly right Right. As a matter of fact, all these individuals that I mentioned that that died um, because of uh, the miseducation of white America and white extremists mm -hmm. that took that message uh, and utilized it uh, in order to kill, that was during Obama's administration. All right. And we were those individuals were touchable. OK, they couldn't get to the president, you know, to, to inflict mm -hmm. that type of hatred upon them. But it's just a common person. You know, I would get many calls. You know, one of the areas of, of law that I, I consult in is employment law. You know, I would mm -hmm. get a lot of calls during a time period of Obama's administration where, you know, African-Americans in their workspaces were under constant barrage of insults, you know, because it just came. Yeah, it just felt like that time period was when people were just really saying things that that I you know you wondered was this was this always in your mind or is, or you just feel the the license to be able to just do this yeah. now and, and 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 that was interesting and Barbara you speak about the license that's one thing that that the president has given people the license mm -hmm. hang on one out. second yes, if you're just joining us we're talking about race baiting language and how it is used politically to divide us with history political and law expert Dr. Eric Claville and his award winning Claville report join our conversation four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call um what are your thoughts about the language that is being used and how it is, is it divisive or is it pulling people together four four zero two six six five one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero um lisa sent me this real quick let me um Take a look. This has happened in Illinois. A uh, gas station clerk told a Latina woman that she needs to go back to her, to her country. Yeah. They fired the, the clerk. This happened at Bucky's Convenience Stores, and the, and the store has confirmed that the employee was let go. Um, so it's, it's you were talking about license. You know, people feel that it's okay now to to go ahead and do these things, I guess, if they were already in that mindset. Right. You know, so remember uh, a couple of years ago, I said that uh, President Trump was the best thing to happen to America. And the reason why I said that is because he would basically end up uncovering a what people really are. All right. It also ended up holding individuals accountable because I felt that public policy was not being uh, not addressing the needs of the common person. Mm -hmm. uh, we always talk about Wall Street, you know, getting their bail out. Main Street is not Main Street's getting worse. The tax cut that I said that was going to come about, which did uh, is giving. All if, if, matter of fact, money knows no color. So if you have money, <laughs> you're benefiting. But we know that money uh, basically is a, that type of money is assigned primarily that wealth to a lot of individuals who are non-black, you know, mm -hmm. because of historical discrimination. So in so there's an imbalance there. But uh, individuals were not getting uh, help, you know, mm -hmm. and and basically what it also did it really uncovered the hearts of people. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, I think about a week and a half ago, the USA Today released a Pew Research uh, study that showed uh, broken down between non-churched individuals, African American uh, Protestants, white evangelicals, and we and, talked and about this on uh, the roundtable last. Oh, week. Oh, you did. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so you know, and, and and it showed you know individuals who would show a heart you know to people you know as Jesus talked about as you do unto least and him you do also unto me mm -hmm. you know how can you say you love me when you don't love your brother that you see and evangelicals you know, these, were the lowest ones in terms of twenty five percent giving uh, in terms of talking about helping the people in, at the border right yeah right. now now <laughs> and now, now now again we're not this isn't the show for it but right. but, but but the realism of why we have all of those crossings is because of the metering that's taking place for legal crossings. You know, so individuals who come to the to the gates, quote unquote, legally, they're being turned away because of the uh, stringent 
changes in during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you also have the funding that was cut during the Bush administration up until now from those countries in order to direct those funds to fight the wars in the Middle East that those countries normally would have that aid to fight and to help individuals in the Latin American uh, countries. So now they're they're finding basically uh, situations that are dire, so dire that they're willing to make a thousand mile trek you know, to the United States for, for help. So that also has to take, be taken into mm-hmm. accountability. So let's go to the phones. Uh, Renee joins us from Hampton. Hi, Renee. You're on the air. Yes. Good evening or afternoon. Good afternoon. I wanted, I wanted to find out whether anyone noticed as I did, I guess after it was played so many times on the media yesterday, did you notice that the initial calls, the initial cat calls, and I'm calling them cat calls, um, uh, came from women. You could hear that the initial individuals that started that that call started were women. to send. And, and, started yes, to send her then, back. Okay. Yes, and then and then the men joined in. And I wanted to uh, ask, you know, uh, whether that was as disquieting for many of you as it was for me. Uh, the fact that the the initial voices that you heard screaming, send her back, send her back, were women's voices. Hmm. And I, I wondered what emboldened them to feel that they could uh, ask, you know, ask this particular question. And the fact that uh, Trump did uh, allow it to go on for a full 13 to 15 seconds prior to uh, trying to change the subject. Yeah. Thanks so much for the call, Renee. We'll let Eric answer that. And he did, the president did try to walk back his, saying that he disagreed with the statement, but he did stand there for 13 seconds. Well, well, well look, I mean, that's, that's been his technique, right? So put it out there for the group that you are in front of, walk it back for the group that you're in front of now, but it's already out there, you mm-hmm. know, but don't try to disparage that group, right? So he said, I was, I was sorry to hear that a little bit, you know, but this, you know, so yeah. he's, he's giving that other group, you know, some leeway and they're also winking saying, okay, he has to do that, but he, we, we know where he stands. Mm-hmm. So, so Barbara, what I, did you think about her point about the women? I didn't notice sure. it, but you know what? I, I did not notice the, you know, it myself. Uh, mm-hmm. However, I have noticed, and we have talked about how Trump actually won more went white women than Hillary Clinton actually won which is, uh, you know, something that individuals have talked about and, and, and pundits have, have, have looked at. Uh, but also, you do see a lot of women. And again, it's a lot of white women at those, uh, the, those events as well. So white American women uh, at those events. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what is it that exists in their mindset and their upbringing that says, hey, you know, uh, we're losing our place as well. You know, is, is that one of the things that individuals are, are saying? But you know, one aspect of belief is that that family belief, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if, if you're taught that in your home, then that becomes part of who you are. If you're around that in your social circle, that becomes part of who you are. And keep in mind, because uh, until the... Uh, it's, and until the increase of women going to college and women, you know, uh, working and making their own money, the wealth of women have a lot has been attached to to their men. To their husbands. Yeah. So, so the wealth of white women is attached to the wealth primarily of their white counterpart, that their their white males. So you end up taking on that belief and that social status that your husband has as well. So, let me take one other call, and then um, I have another question I want to ask you, uh, Alana. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's calling from Norfolk. How are you? Yes, I'm good. How are you? Thank you. Okay. Um, and you did pronounce it correctly. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank Eric for mentioning the Jews, uh, because, yeah, we still do feel a lot of hatred, um, especially these past couple of years. But being that I am Jewish, I wanted to just say that I do find what Omar has said uh, anti-Semitic and reprehensible. And that she not, and she did apologize, but only because she was told to like a child. Um, and I feel that she still needs to be punished. Of course, Trump needs the most punishment. But mm. I just wanted to say that about Representative Omar. And, and how would you punish her? Um, just like how Stephen King was stripped from his committees. Uh, mm. I feel that she should uh, and just serve out her time 
and not be able to run again. Okay. Thanks so much for the call, Alana. We appreciate it. Eric? You know, um, you know, one of those things that when she said she shouldn't be able to run again, I mean, that's dependent upon her district, Somalia. you know, and, 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 and people that uh, vote for her. Now, there, there is a history of, of, of individual Jewish descent, individuals of Middle Eastern descent, and it can go all the way back, <laughs> you know, very, very far back, you know, with two brothers, you know, as it relates to, you know, Old Testament yes. stories. So uh, that's a history that, that that's existed for thousands of years. Uh, and all, you know, so I'm not going to get into that. OK, <laughs> uh, by the way, Ilhan uh, Omar is from Somalia, not Ethiopia. We yes, apologize. Yes. We were we were scrambling, trying to fit, trying yeah. to remember. So I just thank you so much for Jeanette uh, calling us on Facebook. Yes. Letting us know that. So thank you. Thank you we Jenna. appreciate that. So what does this mean for our country? Because we keep saying, and I, I'll give you a perfect example. So when when President Trump was elected, my husband kept saying to me, I'm not worried because there are enough statesmen in Congress uh-huh. and in the Senate that will keep things, you know, on balance. It doesn't feel like things are unbalanced to me personally. Um, but but my question is, when, when does the other side start to speak up, number one? Right. And number two, all this division, it, it goes beyond politics because it seeps into our social fabric. So what do, what do you think this means in terms of where we as the United States of America are going to go forward? forward in terms of this issue of race you know barbara the it's it's been said that the only thing that's needed for evil to exist is for good men not to say or do anything and that holds true today uh there's been a lot of criticism uh rightfully so uh given to the republican party uh for allowing the president to really run roughshod over political process to run roughshod over uh just being presidential Um, We talk about the instability of government, the instability of the White House itself, Uh, the fact that he's not there every weekend. He's going, you know, going golfing, you know, and just the instability that's that's in Washington as it relates to public policy that trickles down to affect the common person. Uh, And right now they're they're handcuffed. Because in part, they gerrymandered their way into this problem, meaning that most of their constituents in a lot of their districts actually agree with the president. So it's really the, the, mm-hmm. it's really the party of Trump when you talk about the Republicans. So you have the GOP umbrella, and then you have conservatives. You have social conservatives, religious conservatives. But then you have Trump supporters that are all in that. So it's that circle that touches all, all of them. All the other circles. Yeah. Exactly. So with that, you have these individuals that actually believe what this individual is saying. I know some people said, oh, he's not a racist. I know him. You know, now, out of the abundance of the heart, doth the mouth speak. So what you say is really what you are or what you believe. When people say, oh, I didn't mean to say that, is really you didn't mean to be heard, <laughs> but you really believe that. You know, and if you and when you start putting those 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 words out there, those words mean something. And they, they reverberate over and over and over again. And of course in our day and time you have sound bites that 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 you know you could hear mm-hmm. again to 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 influence individuals' thought process. Uh, so those individuals on the GOP side, they're they, they I mean they have they, they deserve that criticism that they're getting and they should they should step up and talk talk up to do something to their president. In other words, there's no Barry Goldwater that's well, we left. And we can't hold the, the, the Republicans totally responsible. The Democrats have a, play, a role in this too. Exactly. And you know, we talked about it when the election came. You asked me what was the plan. I said, I don't know. <laughs> uh, right now, I, I said that the Democrats are, you know, what the Tea Party was. Uh, during the time of Boehner. I don't think Pelosi uh, can. Uh, th- I, I don't think there's really a plan, you know, mm-hmm. really to affect the common man and really to deal with this this onslaught that's coming from the president and his supporters. Um, I think that they were under the impression that everybody would kind of get in line with what they all wanted to do, which I don't know what really was. It's a lot of social issues, not economic issues that they're dealing mm-hmm. with uh, that really don't affect the majority of the uh, the U.S. population or their constituents. Uh, so I'm kind of concerned about that direction itself. I think they're 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 just it's like three blind mice. 
that's up there. If you look at Pelosi, if you look at uh, Mitch McConnell, and then, you know, whoever else you want to put in there, you know, there's just three blind mice running around and nobody knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Also, if you look at individuals and again, just the total mismanagement. And we did, did the Mueller report about a month and a half ago on, on the show. It's just a total mismanagement of, you know, the expectations of that report. I mean, it just blew my mind, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, coming back to the statesman part, there is no Barry Goldwater you know, for this Nixon. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is no one that can go into the White House and tell President Trump enough is enough. You have to stop. It simply doesn't exist. Um, And and he's a type, you know, again, I I mentioned about a couple of years ago, economically, we're, and socially, we're at that point that Germany was in during the Great Recession that they had when Adolf Hitler rose to power, the demagoguery the rhetorical devices that he utilized in order to get the people on his side and demonizing a group of people, the Jews, at that particular time and creating a more uh, perfect nation, the Aryan nation itself, uh, which looked nothing like him, but it was a nation that he actually uh, said would uh, lead the world for another 100 years, the Third Reich of Germany which only lasted 15. Uh, we see that now where the president is demonizing the Hispanic people, unfortunately. Um, and you have individuals who were not just born here, but individuals that were here during the Mexican-American War that never really moved, that never moved. So that part of Texas, they just never moved. Yes, mm-hmm. So their family's been here for hundreds of years, and they're told to go back, and that's actually where they're from. And those, unfortunately, uh, for the Hispanic people, they are the... It's very similar to what's happening, what happened to the Jews during the time of, 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 of Hitler as it relates to demonizing, demonizing. Gotcha. a group of people. Yeah, that's because we're not saying. Right, right. Okay, no, no. George joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, George, you're on the air. Uh, uh, I, I would like to, to disagree with uh, the lady that, who previously called in and and uh, uh, said that, that um, the, the lady uh, from the House of Representatives who criticized uh, um, lobbyists from Israel and the government of Israel uh, was anti-Semitic. I, I think that's, that's a false statement. I think that it's easy to understand why if she's Jewish and someone criticized Israel, she, it might have offended her. But at the same time, it, it, it's not anti-Christian or anti uh, Catholic. If I criticize the government or a lobbyist from Italy, you know, we're, we're, she she didn't say anything against the Jewish religion. She criticized uh, uh, policies that that are oppressive to Palestinians and and are not contributing to to uh, peace in the Middle East. I'm not Jewish myself, but I've been to Israel. Many times I'm a retired um, uh, merchant seaman, mm-hmm. and and it's it's an oppressive government. The way they treat Palestinians is is not something Americans should be um, uh, helping. Okay, George, thanks so much for the call. We appreciate it. Anything you want to react to? I know that's not our sure. major topic of discussion, but no, um, but, but 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 to his point, there mm-hmm. is, and and we could probably do a show on it if that's something that I think the public wants to hear. But mm-hmm. there there is a a a real movement against what's called Zionism and Judaism, and it relates to the government of Israel and how it's operating, not the not Jew- the religious, right? Not, not the religion, right? Not, right? Not the religion <laughs> or Jewish people, mm-hmm. but actually the government itself and okay. what they're doing with Benjamin Netanyahu. Yahoo and, and so forth. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see another call, Lisa, or, or should we move move on? Okay, Vernon joins us from Newport News. Hi, Vernon. You're on the air. Uh, good afternoon. How y'all doing? Okay. Good. Uh, I was going to uh, comment or ask the uh, professor's opinion about, since uh, a lot of analysts say the last four, well, three years or so, have been the age of disruption. When you look at the internet, look at streaming and everything, I just don't think that they expected for the government to be disrupted. And Trump is the disruptor of this government, and especially with uh, Bannon's uh, stated purpose, that the whole thing is to break down the government and uh, be about trying to recreate it. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. I want to give our, um, Professor Claville a chance to respond. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Look, 
<laughs> You're right up my alley, you know, because I talked about this a couple of years ago. Uh, Steve Bannon, he is orchestr- has orchestrated, once was orchestrated, the destruction of the administrative state. So this dysfunction that we see in government is actually mm-hmm. something that has been part of what he's wanted to do for years. Steve Bannon is no more in the White House, but... Is, Doesn't mean that there's no influence exactly. there. Exactly. Huh? <laughs> he still has a lot of influence with the president himself. Uh, the president himself is pretty much in it for himself. You know, and there are a lot of people who say, oh, he's doing the Lord's work or God is on Trump's side and things of that nature. And and he's a patriot and he's American and so forth. And I, I tell people as it relates to those issues, just ask yourself, you know, go back to scriptures that you read kind of connected to, you know, things that he says and the policies that are being orchestrated, you know, and ask yourself, is that a true statement, uh, something that you really want to get behind? And that's a personal thing that everybody has to do. You have to mm-hmm. do that. Uh, but basically. Based upon what you believe America should represent, then you're going to follow those policies and those individuals that actually put those policies up, Barbara, and you're going to excuse the missteps, mistakes, and mismanagement of those individuals uh, as long as you get your policies through. And that's one thing that the GOP is doing. They're silent on these issues Mm -hmm. that the president's sending out, the disruption, the dysfunction through Twitter. But they are working feverishly over time behind the scenes, turning uh, policies with um, for certain agencies around, um, making sure that they they're getting their judges uh, on the federal benches in the lower courts as well. Mm-hmm. We're all concerned about the U.S. Supreme Court, but it's the lower courts where things really hurt. That's the point that always worries me when when things like, you know, the 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 disruptor of the week happen is really what's going on behind the scenes, you know, um, in terms of, of it. And it's like, they take something and say, all right, let's throw this out there. So everybody will focus on that while we're back here taking care of business. That's right. That's right. And, and, and it happens all the time. You know, it's, you know, I, I learned from a young age, you know, being around politics and understanding just sitting around, you know, more seasoned people, older, older individuals, that real power is not what you see in front of you, not on television. Okay, that's not real power. Real power is individuals behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. I tell my sons all the time, you know, they see their sports heroes and I say that, you know, they want to be like them. I said, no, be the owner mm-hmm. who writes their checks, not, not they're cashing a check. <laughs> be the one that's writing theirs, you know, and the individuals who's behind the scenes drafting the policies, uh, pushing policies through to affect. And I, I have to give it to the GOP. I really like how they see a 50, 100 year vision and not a five minute soundbite. OK, so we got less than two minutes. Um, next debate is on the 20th of July. Are we going to see any are we going to see anyone rise to the top? I know Biden's at the top right sure. now. I get that. But I'm saying in terms of of um, a, a surprise, if you will, right. like like Barack Obama was a surprise sure. during that time frame. Barbara, I, you know, honestly, I'll, I'll, I don't think so. Uh, okay. I, I, I really have uh, trepidation and I'm sh- I just shake my head a lot when I'm looking at what's happening in the G- uh, Democratic field, how they're really de- devouring each other. Uh, by the time the election comes around, we'll get to uh, election predictions on another show. Yes, we will. I, we'll I, save that for yeah, later. <laughs> but, but, but no, I, I, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> Dr. Eric Laville and his award-winning Claville report. Thank you so much, as always, Eric. I, we really appreciate your insight and your wisdom. And we'll be right back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of the group Take Six, and you're listening to Another View. Oh, you weren't supposed to hear me singing. <laughs> Once considered the best pound for pound boxer in the world, Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker captured titles in four different weight classes. The former Olympic gold medalist died Sunday when he was hit by a car in Virginia Beach. Our Lisa Godley takes a look back at the tumultuous life of a hometown legend. Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker's record as a fighter is mind blowing. Of his recorded 214 amateur bouts, he won all but 13 of them, 
91 by knockout. His amazing record would take him to the Pan American Games in 1983 and the Olympics in 1984, winning gold at both. Winning the gold medal, you know, it was a dream. You know, it was a dream of mine to, uh, to win a gold medal for my mother. My most happiest moment is when I put the gold medal around my mother's neck. I figured, like, you know, my whole life was complete at that point. Then Sweet Pea turned pro. Since 1989, he has won six world title belts without a loss from Norfolk, Virginia. Presenting the four-time world champion and reigning pound-for-pound -pound king, the defending welterweight champion of the world, Pernell Sweet Pea. He started boxing at Norfolk's Young Park Recreation Center in 1973. He was just nine years old. By the time he was 13, he was boxing adults. The 1994 cover of Sports Illustrated billed him as the best, known for his ability to dance around the ring and hit, but not get hit back. During his career, two controversial decisions would haunt him the most. His 1993 bout with Julio Chavez, which many observers thought Sweet Pea had won, was ruled a draw. And his 1997 fight against Oscar De La Hoya. Sweet Pea outpunched his opponent and scored the only knockdown, but the judges, by unanimous decision, awarded the fight to De La Hoya. For the winner by unanimous decision and new Sweet Pea continued to fight through 2001, retiring with a record of 40 wins, four losses, and one draw. He was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame five years later. When interviewed two years ago, the boxing legend expressed why he thinks he's been described as the best defensive fighter of all time. There would never be another Pernell Whitaker. My style is, is sucking to none. It's, it's in the closet now. It's not coming back out here. But with success, there were challenges. Sweet Pea struggled with drug and alcohol addiction throughout his career, and in 2003 served time for violating his probation on a cocaine possession conviction. Throughout his retirement, Sweet Pea worked as a professional trainer here in Hampton Roads and could often be found making special appearances at sporting events. He died Sunday night from injuries sustained when he was hit by a car while crossing an intersection in Virginia Beach. He was 55 years old. Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker, a hometown legend who will truly be missed. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker was raised in Young Terrace community of Norfolk, where Whitaker Lane was named after him. The Whitaker family invites the community to celebrate the life, legacy, and love of the champ on Saturday, July the 20th at the Norfolk Scope. The viewing is from 9 until 11 a.m., and service will begin at 11. All are welcome to attend. And let me give a shout-out to Woodrow Wilson and I.C. Norcom High School Students uh, from their Upward Brown program, they came here to WHRO for the Grand Tour and got a chance to see us before we went, shortly before we went on the air. Thank you for spending an hour of your life with us here on Another View. If you missed part of the show or would like to hear it again, visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. And while you're there, please sign up for our EV newsletter, a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. We're on Facebook, so like us, and I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week on Another View, it's Another View on Health with cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. We're going to be talking about kidney disease. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Bobby Fuller answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so very much for listening to Another View. Another View.